So we are on to lecture 31st and discussing uh, Lernell metallurgy steel making. Uh, we have covered primary steel making, uh, electric arc furnace steel making, uh, uh, the two roots of primary steel making namely uh, the oxygen steel making and electric steel making. Uh, and then we have also discussed uh, stainless steel making in electric arc furnace. Uh, we finished discussing uh, deoxidation of steel, uh, deoxidation thermodynamics and kinetics and we are on to level metallurgy steel making. And uh, I have given you a good overview of the level construction, the features and uh, we were about to you know uh, talk about uh, uh, heating of uh, molten metal or molten steel. In the, in the backdrop of uh, you know 70, 80 minutes of extra time required for treatment in lead that we will have loss of heat and already we have lost quite a bit of heat during tapping of steel <coughs> 60 to 70 degrees depending on the furnace conditions etc. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know the first step before we can think of any inclusion modification or calcium injection or removal of nitrogen through vacuum degassing, uh, we have to now jack up the temperature such that during the process or the subsequent processing operations, you know we do not face in a difficult situation because the metal may chill, its viscosity may increase and under extreme condition, uh, the metal may partially solidify within the little which will be highly undesirable. Okay? So, heating is what we uh, were talking and I mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, the heating is basically arc heating and uh, we will not do any chemical heating because chemical heating will try to, but chemical heating is basically done by using aluminum and oxygen okay? uh, because this is the same principle as in aluminothermic process. Okay? So, aluminum oxidation releases heat and you know it helps to elevate the temperature of molten metal, but that has a desire you know uh, that tends to impair steel quality because of generation of deoxidation product uh, sorry uh, a product oxidation product like Al2O3 which contaminates steel. So, chemical heating at this stage when steel is refined, primary steel making is completed, deoxidation is completed you know and we are advancing towards uh, you know the final uh, chemistry, uh, the target chemistry uh, at that particular stage perhaps it is not desirable to take chance and contaminate steel. So, arc heating basically the same principle, the same facilities that one uses in doing arc heating you know uh, that is being used. So, mostly AC arc heating is used with three electrodes. And we have, uh, you know, if we represented it schematically, then we have a porous plug here. So, let me just uh, draw it a little bit elaborately, and then we have the gas purging plug is shown here. So, which is this, uh, and then we have <coughs> basically the cover goes like this. So, the cover is. So, the ladle after uh, tapping is over okay, is on the rail and the, the ladle sitting on the ladle, ladle uh, the ladle sitting on the rail is now dragged towards the LRF station which is known as the ladle refining furnace station. And there we have three different uh, you know kinds of uh, we have a roof uh, which is attached to a robotic arm and there are three different uh, electrodes as it is as it was there in the case of and then we have <coughs> arc is stuck and as a result of which what happens the molten metal uh, starts to and we have bubbles here and basically <coughs> and now you can see that why the plug is not directly you know just like in electric arc furnaces we do not submerge uh, the electrode here the sub the you may have the slag layer here the slag layer because the sparting action the slag layer can you know it looks up to scale so we have a quite a bit of freeboard here and this is the little cover you know cover uh, these are the three electrodes and this is a separate attachment altogether which is on an arm which can be you know uh, once the operation is over it can be raised and removed and making the ladle free so that it can be now taken elsewhere for subsequent processing. So, 
as I have indicated. So, we have uh, basically, so these are our arc and as a result of which we have a starring action here and because of this what happens uh, the heat is advected into the belt and the heating rate basically goes up to you know depending on the operating conditions about 3 to 4 degree centigrade per minute. That is the kind of uh, heating typically. So, a 30 minutes of time 20, 20, 25, 30 minutes of time is enough to give you you know compensate for uh, the 60, 70 degrees drop and as well as jack up the temperature to about 1620 degrees centigrade which you call as an LRF out temperature in the industry. Okay? And so is that the subsequent processing because we will have other processes and you know another 30, 40 minutes some drop in temperature will take place and yesterday I have said that you know from about 0 0.3 to about 0 0.7 uh, degree centigrade per minute that is going to be the range of temperature drop depending on uh, the size of the ladles whether you know you have a thick slack cover, you have a physical cover, how good the refractory qualities and so on and so forth. So, this is the range. So, there is going to be an enormous temperature drop downstream as well. So, therefore, you know a 30 minutes of or 25 minutes of ladle uh, you know arcing in ladle is good enough to raise the temperature of the molten metal. So, the heating principle is pretty much simple. It is similar to the electric arc furnace. So, nothing needs to be discussed here. Okay. So, argon is blown here uh, continuously so that we have good stirring so that the heat or the hot fluid from this part can be taken and distributed elsewhere and therefore, we get a thermally homogeneous melt in the system. Without uh, argon injection there is going to be you know the upper layer is going to be hot and hot fluid is lighter. So, it will try to stay here forever and the bottom part is going to be cooler and that perhaps is not going to be desirable. During the process itself, there are shoots available up through which you know we can have some additions here. Now, this, are, this is a deoxidized bath, we must remember. Okay? The bath does not contain now any dissolved oxygen, or if it is aluminum killed, it contains about 10 ppm oxygen or something like that. Okay? And then we can have added some alloying elements here also, depending on if you want to <coughs> uh, make alloy steels and so on and so forth. So, immediately there are two important things in the LRF station which is important after arcing. These are called cold wire injection, cold wire injection. And mostly uh, there are you know, many plants uses uh, different kinds of injection. The injection of aluminum uh, and calcium are most common. So, sometimes ferro aluminum is used or pure aluminum wire can be used. And this is like you have, for example, the schematically it looks something like this. If you have a ladle here, and then you have, you know, some kind of a <coughs> say platform here, and then we have a roller here, and then from here, okay, with a guiding pulley, maybe the wire is fed into the system. So, this is <coughs> so that is how the wire feeding is basically done. It is a very complicated scenario here. So, we have a huge roll which is available from which the wire is drawn. So, there are motorized facilities here which will put in wire into the melt at a certain speed, and the speed would be several meters uh, per minute. Uh, okay. That is the kind of speed that we are talking about. And these are these calculations are already done based on you know what should be the wire diameter for a given wire diameter you know what should be uh, uh, the speed uh, you know so that we can get uh, it you know below the surface. So suppose if it is aluminum, the first question is why do we need to inject aluminum? Okay, because as I have indicated that the lump addition of aluminum during the tapping stage may not yield the correct oxygen or the desirable aluminum content of the melt to ensure that there is you know requisite amount of oxygen. So, if there is 1 or 2 ppm of oxygen imbalances okay, um, few ppm and then we need to adjust accordingly the aluminum content more aluminum needs to be pumped in. Okay. Suppose, we got about 14 ppm oxygen as opposed to our requirement of 10 ppm oxygen. So, for this for this additional 4 ppm we need to pump in more oxygen aluminum and then perhaps uh, you know uh, addition of desirable you know aluminum 
uh, in the lump condition is not going to be uh, very useful. You must understand that when we have tapping, in the case of tapping, there is a huge amount of intensity of stirring. So, whatever aluminum you are adding, that aluminum is melting and dispersing into the system. But in this system, if you try to add such a strong convection current is not possible. Okay? And also, because of the tapping stream in the vicinity of the stream, you have uh, you know, enormous downward flow which takes, you know, tends to take lighter aluminum dip inside the melt, melt it uh, and dissolve it without letting it getting exposed to the environment itself. So, when beyond little LRF or in the LRF, it is perhaps not desirable. You can add elements like lead, you can add elements like you know ferrochrome, etc. Uh, but perhaps adding pure aluminium, which has a very light, you know, um, small density relative to steel, perhaps is not desirable because it will like to float on the free surface, eaten up by the slag if it contains FeO or react with the atmospheric oxygen. So that minute adjustment needs to be done with a sophisticated method and that sophisticated method is the aluminum wire feeding because it ensures that aluminum is liquid here. Okay? It melts subsurface, so the wire is solid and then as the wire gets progressively heated, you know due to heat transfer from the melt to the wire surface at some certain point of time the wire is going to melt and these calculations are done a priori. that what should be for a given diameter, what should be the speed of the wire such that I can achieve a desired melting condition you know <coughs> 3 feet or 5 feet below the bath. So, these calculations can be performed and if you do not do this kind of a calculation actually and if you try to put in wire at a very high speed, the solid wire can come here, strike the floor and rebound back and this could lead to you know fatal accidents in the plant. So, all these calculations etc are done properly and subsurface melting of aluminum is thereby ensured and you really know that you know with practice you have that for how long you have to inject aluminum so that you can get you know that 4 additional ppm or 10 additional ppm of aluminum into the melt which will cause a reduction in the oxygen and bring it to the exact target uh, value. So, most of the modern steel plants have wire feeding facilities and aluminum wire feeding is basically done immediately after heating. Uh, in order to adjust the final oxygen content of the melt and jack up the aluminum content thereby a little bit not too much. Uh, we must remember that significant deoxidation is performed during furnace tapping uh, operation. So, in addition to aluminum uh, wire feeding, calcium wire feeding is also very frequently practiced in steel industries and mostly in all alloy steel plants. Now, before we talk of calcium uh, injection in steel, I would like to uh, briefly discuss that we have mentioned that, uh, that there is this deoxidation product uh, which is solid and there is deoxidation product manganese silicate okay, MnOSiO2 which can be liquid, cannot be liquid depending on in what ratio MnOSiO2 and uh, the problem that uh, I have solved in the last class where you know uh, we considered 45 wet percentage of SiO2 and 55 wet percentage of MnO that gives us a liquid deoxidation product. Liquid deoxidation product is more favorable I have already mentioned if you remember because during their rise because these are all lighter particles and they will tend to rise because these are oxides. So, the liquid liquid can come together and the coalescence of liquids you know two liquid blobs are much larger than two solid particles coming together. So, a liquid deoxidation product is desirable. But it is not possible always for example, with aluminum de deoxidation that we can get a solid deoxidation product, a liquid deoxidation product. So, we, we get Al2O3 which is solid. Similarly, if you get you know other compositions, some manganese silicate compositions or aluminum silicate compositions, you know uh, they are pure silica is of course, in solid phase and we will get aluminum, aluminum, aluminum silicate okay? uh, or you know other compositions of magnesium uh, amino SiO2. So, say so, MnO 3 SiO 2 these are all solid phases. So, and our target would be that we should get liquid deoxidation products because once the liquid deoxidation product coalesces their size becomes bigger and according to Stokes law we know their rise velocity is proportional to velocity raised to the power 2 or square of the velocity. Okay? So, therefore, bigger the particle better is the removal efficiency or flotation efficiency of the inclusion and it would be this objective that you know efforts are being made to engineer the deoxidation product 
uh, which uh, is in the liquid phase. Now, there are other, these are, the, as I said, that these particles, deoxidation products, if they remain entrapped in steel, they, con they contain, it, they, they, they form what is known as endogenous inclusions. And I have also given you an idea about endogenous versus exogenous inclusions. Now, there are various types of inclusions which are possible. I just want to give you a brief, uh, you know, account for the next 10 minutes or so that, for example, you can have refractory dissolution, MgO, okay, from uh, you know, oxygen is from the metal, Mg is there uh, from the refractory magnesium dissolution or and then uh, an MgO is also present in the refractories and then if you have, you know, we have aluminia, then we have a, a, an oxide, so magnesium aluminate for example, these are called spinel kind of an exit, double oxides actually, double oxides of aluminia, aluminia, okay. This is one kind of possibility. Now, these inclusions, suppose, suppose if they remain entrapped in steel and you take a steel solidified steel sample, look it under microscope, then you should be able to see these foreign particles. Okay? Just like the way if you are making a, you know, uh, bread or chapati out of you know, your dough and then you put some uh, what you call seeds in it, a cumin seeds or something, the way you will see those with your naked eyes is the same way you will see, you know, of course, different shapes. Okay? sometimes spherical, sometimes non-spherical, uh, you know, sometimes uh, strings, long strings, etc. Different kinds of shapes are possible, but you can see them, you know, under microscope, of course, because we know that we are talking about 50 microns, 60 microns, 70 microns size particles, nothing above 100 micron size remains in the belt. So, in the solidified material, you can see these inclusions uh, under microscope and you can also know their exact compositions if you have an EDS facility attached to your scanning electron microscope under which you may be observing these inclusions. Okay? And that will tell you that these inclusions contain Mg, these inclusions contain aluminum, these inclusions contain silicon. So, all these peaks will come in EDS response curve and therefore, you will be able to identify that what is the composition of the steel. And composition of the composition of inclusion and composition of inclusions will tell you or give you a first hand information about their origin for example. If you say, for example, MgO is there in the inclusion that you detect, you will immediately know that this MgO cannot have come from your deoxidizer addition, it's, it must have come from your refractory erosions or refractory dissolutions. We have, I must also say that we are making many additions into steel during the process, be it deoxidizer, be it alloying additions and so on and so forth. So, all these things bring in along with them certain amount of impurities. For example, Ferrosilicon added into steel bath is known to contain 4 and 5 ppm around calcium. Similarly, if you have silicomanganese, silicomanganese is found to contain Mg, magnesium. So, the source, okay, you have to know that whatever you are adding, okay, those precise composition of those must be known so that those additions need not be or should not be a you know, source of contamination of steel melts and we must understand at this particular stage we are talking about concentration of various species in the range of only few ppm. So, nothing is negligible. So, we want to have you know as pure material or um, additions as possible, but also we know that as purity increases the cost of production will also tend to go up. So, the spinel reaction these are called spinel or double oxides they are also solid under steel making conditions. This these are solids, they are non-deformable. For example, if you have manganese sulfide inclusions in steel, manganese sulfide is a liquid under steel making condition okay? and this is a highly deformable. When hot rolling goes on, the manganese sulfide inclusions deform very readily and you know, uh, they do not. So, but on the other hand, alumina, spinel, etc., are very uh, hard inclusions. So, you can have calcium sulfide injection, calcium sulfide inclusions also. These are also solid inclusions. So, different various kinds of inclusions oxides are possible in steel and for example, you can get some inclusions containing <coughs> sodium oxide. We will see or you know sodium and potassium and sodium and potassium where from they come? The sodium and potassium as we will see comes from continuous casting where you use mold powders and the mold powders contain some you know few percentage of sodium oxide and potassium oxide. So, looking at the inclusions we will be able to or knowing its composition, we will be able, able to identify the source, you know, uh, in the first go that where from they have come and then 
take according to you know uh, the composition corrective measures or strategy in order to see that future hits do not contain such kind of inclusions and so on and so forth. So various kinds of inclusions we will see in steel and as I said their sizes are not going to be appreciable and some of these inclusions are deformable, some of these inclusions are non-deformable. So you can imagine that if the inclusions are non-deformable in that case when you apply stress on the material then what is going to happen to the inclusion and then these inclusions are non-coherent particles. Okay? They are they become the spot of source you know uh, where from the cracks etc nucleates the stress concentration takes place and as a result of which their concentration is very important in determining the surface life of the components that we use in engineering applications. So, <clears throat> having given this background now uh, you know the calcium injection is going to be easier for you. We may also understand that these inclusions which are solid they have refractory origins for example, the refractory materials are more or less friendly with them because they have the refractories will also contain MgO, refractories will also contain uh, Al2O3. So, uh, the inclusions are you know the, they do not the, they do not they are not comfortable with the metal they have a preference to you know uh, be friendly with the refractories. So, when we drain material from or the, the, or the, or the material contain melt containing inclusions pass through the refractory you know pass adjacent to the refractory then they have a great you know uh, they feel some kind of an attraction and the inclusions tend to get deposited uh, on the wall itself. So, wall adhesion is a very important mechanism for inclusion removal and but this wall adhesion itself when we will be draining if you remember that we have a little drain here or you know a well block through which molten metal is going to be drained. It is when the inclusions pass through this you know uh, there may be you know deposition of inclusions. This is not so prominent in littles because from little the flow rate is relatively high that will be clear when I will you know draw a little tandish mold set up in the next class and explain to you uh, you know that what happens beyond the little metal at this stage making say. But per se we can say that when molten metal will if you say flow through a nozzle okay, if the nozzle has this kind of a geometry and then if you have you know uh, something like the flow takes place because of this curvature if the that is the way it takes place, that is the way the flow takes place and then this part does not experience the flow. So, the steel whatever you know this is virtually stagnant vena contractor that is what we call it and that is why no nozzles are you know so sharp corner and they are basically contoured along with this such that this could be completely eliminated. But that is a different uh, scenario altogether when you have this kind of a thing then of course you have no vena contractor. So, the two sides of the figure are shown one with a chamfered nozzle geometry another with a sharp corner and this is the part you know where we can see that because it is stagnant there is not much flow. So, there is going to be deposition of inclusions okay. the inclusions come here will naturally feel attracted towards the refractory wall having the same kind of a composition and the deposition of inclusion will take place. What will then happen? the net area through which molten metal is flowing will get reduced and then what is going to happen if molten metal cannot flow through this the level of liquid in this container is going to rise up and up and up and you know we will not be able to say transfer material or cast material at very high rate. So, deposition of solid inclusions at nozzle which we will see later on in you know and develop more understanding of it when we talk of Tandish can you know. Uh, have a serious consequences. This can eventually this you know if the nozzle particularly for certain cases when the nozzle diameter is small the deposition can be so severe that the nozzle clogging can take place that means no material can now flow. So, continuous sintering of uh, the inclusion particles onto the refractory wall can eventually lead to from constricted nozzle to a completely choked nozzle okay? and this phenomena can actually uh, jeopardize the steel making operation itself. So, therefore, and this is so true about the solid and the liquids if you have liquids as I said the liquids will possibly coalesce together and they will be uh, floating up. So, the steel will eventually contain you know very few liquid uh, uh, deoxidation products uh, they will mostly contain the solid inclusions like alumina, magnesia etcetera which will eventually be 
you know depositing uh, you know to the refractory walls could we attempt to drain one vessel into another as is experienced during continuous casting of steel. So therefore, you know in low carbon aluminum killed steel. So if you are killing with silicon and manganese, silicon manganese, there is no question of solid deoxidation products. So the problem that I am talking is you know uh, relevant to aluminum killed steel and particularly when you have lower carbon okay low carbon naturally gives you lot of oxygen carbon oxygen equilibrium carbon and oxygen uh, equilibrium relationship is a hyperbolic relationship that we have studied. So, smaller is the carbon more is the equilibrium oxygen and to take out that oxygen you have to really pump in more amount of aluminum into the system and as I have indicated roughly about 400 ppm of oxygen will be there in the dissolve in the melt okay, um, in equilibrium with about 10 percent uh, 10 ppm uh, oxygen at about 1600 degree centigrade. Now, so in the process of removal significant amount of Al 2 O 3 inclusions are going to be generated. Okay. So, what these inclusions can solid inclusions can get deposited on the wall and when we have such a large aluminum uh, alumina Al 2 O 3 particles generated in our effort to remove or deoxidize the bath to a very large extent in that case there is naturally a you know danger that nozzle clogging is going to be. If you, if you do not treat steel containing large amount of Al 2 O 3 inclusions there is an invariable opportunity that you will have deposition in the nozzle and you will have this is a well documented fact people have taken out samples from the industry looked under microscope and they have seen that there is a huge amount of build up of aluminum inclusions around the nozzle walls for example or nozzles through which the molten deoxidized metal flows from one vessel to another vessel or for example more specifically at Tandish nozzle. We have not heard this term so far, we will see it in next class or so. Okay. So, <clears throat> therefore, now so if nozzle clogging and that we will have to in alloy steel we will have to deoxidize the bath to a very severe extent that we will generate Al 2 O 3 too much in the system. Okay. A good part of it is going to remain entrapped in steel and that the alumina particles get naturally attracted towards the refractory and get deposited. So, therefore, unless we do something this is going to be a perpetual problem. Okay? Of course, if you can devise a technique by which you can assume sir whatever Al 2 O 3 will be generated in my ladle everything will be floated up there is no problem then this question what I am discussing the issue I am discussing becomes absolutely or totally irrelevant. Okay? So, therefore, we can now say that having accepted the fact that some Al 2 O 3 particles are going to be entrapped in aluminum kill steel our objective would be can we do something about it that means our approach would be to convert that uh, solid Al 2 O 3 into liquid we cannot eliminate it because it is too small we cannot agitate the bath we cannot do any chemical addition no, you know we do not want to disturb the bath because the chemistry etc is fine we do not want to expose it to environment. So, there are not too many uh, you know things that we can really do, but the question is we understand from our knowledge that if you can somehow convert these solid inclusions into liquid inclusions okay? uh, in that case what happens is uh, because they have naturally a rising tendency uh, and these liquids can coalesce together and then as a result of which they can get eliminated uh, circumventing uh, partially or entirely the problem of nozzle. Uh, clogging during continuous casting of steel. So, calcium injection in steel, calcium injection in LCAK steel, low carbon aluminum kill steel, is an approach okay, which attempts to clean up the steel such that problems like nozzle clogging, etc., are not surfaced. Now, what happens is that if you look at the calcium oxide and aluminum phase diagram. I will just roughly do it and you can refer to you know my textbook or look at the net. So, if you look at the phase diagram, so this is 100 percent CO and this is 100 percent Al 2 O 3, then the calcium oxide has a melting point I think uh, of roughly about 25 70 degrees centigrade. This is about uh, you know 2000 2, approximately degrees centigrade. Okay? And then if you look at here somewhere around 50 percent okay? and this is 
suppose let us say this is 1600 degree centigrade. This line is 1600, this is our still making temperature per se and this is I would say is 1500 degree rock bottom temperature in level 1550. Below if we go below this then there is a chance of premature solidification and lot of other problems. So, I will roughly draw the line and then you can see here that what happens basically this line goes something like this okay, and then it comes something like this then it goes like this okay, somewhere here. That is the way roughly it looks like and this is a liquid phase. So, within this calcium oxide and Al2O3 are in liquid and this is approximately 50 weight percentage. So, that means calcium oxide and Al2O3 if you take the formula here that you know the equal weight percentage then it comes out that this is CaO 12 and 7 Al2O3. If you take the molecular weight of CaO multiplied by 12 and molecular weight of Al2O3 multiplied by 7, you will find they are approximately in the ratio. This is 52 percent precisely, I have drawn it as a 50 percent. And it is here that in the still making region, you will see that you can have a small little window because these are all solid fields. You have all solid plus liquid, here also you will have you know solid plus liquid and so on. So, these solids of course, S1, S2, S3 different kinds of solids and 50 percent percentage is 12 CaO 7 Al2O3 and then if you go a little bit this way, this, this region is perhaps CaO and Al2O3. So, this is the region at still making condition where you can heat because this you see here for example, it will go up to 1620, 40 degree or 50 degree or 1700 degree centigrade. Okay? So, you will to get to a liquid region here you will require 1700, so that is not possible. So, I am talking of you know that I want to convert that Al2O3 by injection of calcium okay, forming calcium and I see that I have a small operating window which is available around 1550 or 1600 degree centigrade. Okay, and that gives me uh, a composition of about 12 CO Al2O3. If you change this, if you go to this side, more amount of this side essentially means that you have more aluminum, alumina. Okay, so therefore, and this side is less alumina, so more CO, more CO will give you a solid product. More Al2O3, less CO will give you an L you know solid product, but if you have controlled amount of CO in proportion to L2O3 you know their weights being in the ratio of 7 is to 12, then there is a possibility that you will be operating in this small window and around 1550, 1600 degree centigrade you know you can hit a region where you have uh, you know if a liquid deoxidation product. It of course you know requires that you have to have some idea about the how much of L2O3 is there. And so, therefore, how much of CO has to be pumped in so that they are in 12 is to 7 ratio. This is typically referred to as C12. <coughs> that is the short form of this particular name itself. So, calcium is injected into steel to convert Al2O3 into a liquid product, and this here is liquid at still making temperature around 1570, 1580, 1600 degree centigrade this is liquid. So, you know you have to correctly inject the calcium into the into system and what are the reactions that can take place. So, we will inject by the same wire feeding technique and calcium wire feeding, calcium is basically no not pure calcium, it is either calcium silicide or calcium iron. This is called cassie and this is called caffe in industry. Okay? So, and this calcium is a very light element. So, when you use this then what happens is uh, the effective concentration. So, this could be about 30 percent, 30 weight percent calcium that is the typical concentration because 
calcium, if you let us look at some of the characteristics of calcium, low melting point constituents, okay, it melts about uh, 839 degree centigrade, I think, and vaporizes completely at 1500 degree centigrade. So, therefore, since steel bath is 1600 degree centigrade, the moment you put in a L aluminum, uh, you know, sorry, calcium ware in the form of cassie or caffeine, okay, what happens? It forms a gaseous phase because this is the vaporization temperature, vaporization temperature, and this is the melting temperature. So, under steel making condition, calcium is a is stable only as a gaseous phase, and as a result of which, huge amount of gas plumes are generated, and these gaps you know will pass in no time having residence time within the melt less than one second or so. So, therefore, you can expect that the calcium transfer from the gas to the metal is going to be not that high. So, much calcium cannot be you know uh, pumped into the metal itself. So, we have calcium which is solid, then it becomes calcium which is liquid, then calcium which is liquid becomes calcium which is gas, and then calcium which is gas that becomes calcium sorry calcium which is dissolved in steel that is the entire series of you know reactions that causes calcium dissolution. But now since bulk of the calcium will be escaping in the form of bubbles it is understood that the calcium recovery is going to be extremely small. Calcium also has very low solubility in steel how much calcium at 1600 degree centigrade is 300 ppm and we remember I said that our oxygen is about 2300 ppm, nitrogen is about uh, 470 ppm, hydrogen is about 28 ppm in steel making condition. So, solubility of calcium is not that too appreciable and that the calcium is in the gaseous stage it tends to in the kinetics is such that the contact time between the melt and gas uh, or, or, or the vapor gaseous calcium is not significant. So, therefore, we can expect that you know the recovery of calcium is only about 9 to 23 percent. So, that means, if you give 100 grams inject 100 grams of calcium into the metal, you can only get 9 grams of calcium 9 to 23 is the range 23 grams of oxygen calcium sitting in the metal itself. So, calcium injection we know and this is a very expensive material. Okay. These are <coughs> if you give pure calcium then pure calcium will vaporize in no time itself. Okay. The you will it will be very difficult to submerge uh, keep the steel submerged I hope you can see that point. So, this silicon actually dilutes calcium iron actually dilutes calcium and they also increase the density of uh, uh, caffeine and cassie. So, therefore, uh, they tend to go down okay, along with the uh, wear itself, but if you use pure calcium then possibly the alloy will melt and vaporize here itself you know uh, in decreasing the efficiency of the injection process more. So, <coughs> calcium injection therefore, since the recovery rate is small lot of calcium goes into waste we must understand that calcium re re treatment is not done for every grade of steel. It is done to produce ultra clean steel even if there is no you know this kind of a scenario, but at least we know that calcium if we can inject it correctly there is a lot of engineering involved which is not so simple as I am trying to tell you. Okay? And because the recovery of calcium fluctuates uh, because we do not know how much of Al2O3 is there there is no certainty that we can inject right amount of calcium into the steel. And as you have seen if you do more amount of calcium okay, uh, then in that case we are in problem we get some kind of a solid phase here. Similarly, if you do less amount of uh, uh, calcium injection then we get also different kinds of you know not 12 CO say 7 Al 2 3, but different compositions of calcium aluminate which are solid. So, therefore, correct dosage of calcium that needs to be injected you know uh, needs to be evaluated in the plant by extensive trials and calculations. Okay. Coming back to this particular point that calcium injection therefore, calcium is used to produce clean steel, calcium is used to circumvent the problem of nozzle clogging and calcium injection is not justified for every inclusion you know uh, grade of steel because it adds to the cost of steel these are expensive items. And then the final reaction that calcium which dissolves into steel 
and then we have uh, x plus 1 by 3 it is written in terms of x uh, is L 2 O 3 and basically uh, the equation is written as calcium oxide into x L 2 O 3 and that essentially tells this x could be anything it could be 7 by 12 it could be 6 by 12 it could be 1 and so on because there is a series of calcium aluminates which can form under steel making condition and then this is 2 by 3 that is the final <coughs> reaction okay? and <coughs> once if you can do the correct dosage of calcium injection okay, in that case you can hit jackpot you can get this x factor 7 by 12 and then you know you have a liquid deoxidation product and this liquid deoxidation products if you give enough holding time to the liquid that we will see later on also okay, then the calcium oxide aluminate inclusions can float up, float up producing clean steel. So, that is briefly you know the calcium uh, the subject of calcium or the code wire injection. Now, having said that so we have done uh, deoxidation uh, we have finished heating the temperature is you know uh, this injection etcetera will not cause this is a trim composition adjustment small adjustment small amount of solid material is used. So, therefore, they are not going to cause significant drop in temperature, but there is a step which is coming ahead of us where the temperature drop could be uh, enormous that we will discuss next, but so we have increased the temperature may be 1620 degree centigrade that is the temperature that we are LRF out temperature and then you know by the time we finish another 30 40 minutes operation and go for the final casting step we have you know within plus minus 5 degree a temperature of the belt which is desired by the casting casting shop. So, once this is done so the cleanliness of steel is taken into account, but we have not given as I said that we will give the little time to sit for about 5 to 7 minutes you know. So, that all these liquid reactions which have taken place liquid deoxidation products which have you know formed because of calcium treatment they have enough chance holding of the little is very very important for us okay? that is very important quiescent bath, but right now the bath is no more quiescent the stirring goes on. Okay? The stirring allows various reactants to come in contact with the together. So, at no stage throughout the secondary little metallurgy steel making steps okay? from the moment tapping starts to the moment little is taken to a vacuum degasser okay? continuously argon purging is to be done and there I you have also noticed that you know uh, the plug is away I think this point I categorically did not mention otherwise you know there is going to be extensive uh, uh, attack of the electrodes by the bubbles particularly because uh, the surface is going to be elev elevated because of the, if the plug is located here okay, then there is going to be direct interaction with the electrode causing you know dissolution of carbon electrode or wear and tear of the carbon electrode. So, that is why there is a there is a terminology called pith circle diameter. So, if you draw the three electrodes and then you have a circle you know sub subscribing this uh, electrodes then the porous plug will always be outside that pith circle diameter such that the you know rising plume argon steel plume do not interact directly uh, with electrodes. This phenomena of electrodes getting attacked by the plug is called in the industry as electrode hunting phenomena. We also must understand that there is lot of ejection of droplets because of the sparting actions. So, if you do not have good freeboard then what happens is deposition can takes place and that can cause problem like hood jamming etcetera for the arc furnace roof uh, for the uh, LRF little furnace roof. So, there are some problems there is a gas cleaning apparatus also. So, a lot of you know if you are doing some additions etcetera. So, you can have of gas. So, all the argons which are being injected along with you know some dust as well as uh, the droplets which are produced here they are you know uh, suck there is a hood here and through the hood that uh, is uh, taken out. Okay? So, that I think this portion I <coughs> did not mention these are not so significant, but I thought that before I wind up the discussion of calcium injection and LRF operations okay, I should mention this. Now, following this uh, so, temperature is controlled, cleanliness is controlled and now comes that we have 
you know, nitrogen and hydrogen dissolved in steel. Okay? And uh, nitrogen comes because of the furnace tapping operation, uh, hydrogen comes from arc furnaces, 5 to 7 ppm, and we want to get down this dissolved nitrogen content. And there is a now vacuum treatment of steel. So, we say vacuum degassing. That is a typical and that is how it takes such a long time. We are doing one process after another, huh? heating deoxidation, then heating, then cold wire injection, then vacuum degassing and now you can see. So, 30 minutes we have 20, 30 minutes we have spent in heating only, okay? another 10, 15 minutes for this wire injection etcetera, then transportation comes and then we take to vacuum degassing where again you know we can have 25 to 30 minutes of processing time. And after vacuum degassing, we will disconnect this plug and let the material stand still in the ladle itself. This is called the holding period. The ladle is now, ladle will start wait for about 10 minutes okay? and after that it is going to be lifted and taken to the casting bay itself. But as of now, we will not disconnect the plug. Even in vacuum degassing stage, we will continue to blow argon through liquid steel and we will you know, now subject uh, the ladle. Uh, into uh, what is known as uh, vacuum degassing. This principle of vacuum degassing uh, can be you know very easily looked at from uh, the reverse converse of uh, what is known as uh, <coughs> Sivert's law. dissolution of diatomic gases in metals. So, so, the gases are now like nitrogen is here and hydrogen is here in the dissolved state and we want to drive this into and thermodynamics tells us that smaller is the partial pressure of nitrogen, more will be the tendency for nitrogen this reaction to go from left to right smaller is the hydrogen partial pressure, okay? then greater will be the tendency of hydrogen to leave the metal phase. And by subjecting uh, molten steel to vacuum, okay? what we are essentially ensuring, we are subjecting steel to an atmosphere of about 1 millibar pressure, 10 to the power minus 3 bar. Okay? So, now there are two types of, so this is the principle that the, you have steel and the steel should be exposed to vacuum okay? and typical pressure that is used okay? which essentially as I said low pressure this is you know 1 millibar is an extremely low pressure with regard to the atmospheric pressure. So, therefore, this virtually means that in the gas phase there is no nitrogen gas present, in the gas phase there is no hydrogen gas. So, the gas phase where the gas phase which will be above the ladle or see so the vessel is like this which contains steel and if the it is enclosed in a reactor and I say the pressure here is you know 1 millibar that essentially tells us that the entire steel surface uh, of course normally we will see that there is a slag layer here. So, everything is subjected to 1 millibar atmosphere and when you have this argon purging then what happens is this argon purging basically it removes, it exposes the molten's. it goes like this. So, the slag is here, the slag is here, but this part which is known as the eye of the is exposed and therefore, this where the metal here is going to be exposed to an environment of 1 millibar. So, the metal will see a gas which will not contain any dissolved, uh, any nitrogen or oxygen because the partial pressure is extremely the pressure uh, is extremely small. So, in vacuum we ensure a very small pressure of the order of 1 millibar and therefore, help drive nitrogen and hydrogen from the melt. So, there is a kinetics of uh, you know gas removal you have to understand that for how long you know you know that you have to you know 40 ppm nitrogen you want to get 10 ppm for how long you have to process. So, you require some kind of uh, you know uh, kinetic calculations which will take you uh, tell you about the time. And these reactions, degassing reactions basically 
these are heterogeneous reactions. What does this take place? This takes place at the slag metal interface. This is sorry, melt gas interface. Melt gas interface. So, this is the vacuum and this is the melt, and this reaction takes place at this particular interface. So, unless this is visible, the melt is exposed to the vacuum, these reactions will not take place. So, therefore, we see here that the how we expose the melt. So, it is the argon stirring okay, which pushes the slag exposing the molten metal to the vacuum and there the moment we stop argon purging here, the entire slag is going to be covered covering the molten metal surface and as a result of which the condition that the melt will be able to see the vacuum is no longer going to be satisfied and as a result of which you know even though thermodynamic conditions are favorable because of this kinetic barrier there is going to be no removal of nitrogen or hydrogen. We all know that uh, vacuum degassing or you know this reactions are basically mass transfer control and the kinetics of the reaction takes, tells us <coughs> concentration of nitrogen which decreases as a function is a rate constant multiplied by we have the bulk concentration C n minus the surface concentration and that surface concentration can be taken to be almost is equal to 0. So, knowledge of rate constant is determined is important. Okay? If you, so, the knowledge of rate constant basically is an experimental parameter which in this particular case is the mass transfer coefficient into area divided by the volume and it has a dimension of about 1 by second. So, once you determine this you will be able to find out what is the bulk concentration of nitrogen. So, this is what it is melt phase nitrogen content which is changing as a function of time can be predicted and then by using this kinetic relationship you will be able to know that. Uh, to remove to get to a nitrogen content of 10 ppm for how long really you have to star the, the information of the kinetics. For example, this mass transfer coefficient is a function of the velocity field which is prevalent in the system. It is a the interfacial area is there A, it is a function and the volume of the liquid of course is fixed once the lead is fixed. So, these are the two most important parameter kinetic parameters as far as the rate of nitrogen or hydrogen removal is concerned okay? and based on this kinetic analysis the processing time can be determined. But the moment you put you know initially it is ex exposed to atmosphere you put the ladle inside it for example then you have to depressurize the chamber you have to apply a vacuum pump or a diffusion pump and try to extract okay? and create the vacuum itself and establishment of the vacuum may take you know considerable amount of time. So, you can if you the, I said about 25 to 30 minutes of time is necessary okay? somewhere I have mentioned. So, therefore, in the vacuum degassing process 15 minutes half of the time will go in the establishment of the pressure itself okay? and the remaining half will be the treatment time. So, there are two phases and this is what I am discussing here is called the tank degassing process. So, there are two types of vacuum degassing process one we call as a tank degassing whereby the ladle itself is pushed, put in a big container which is you know uh, then, then maintained in vacuum and there is another one which is called circulation degassing. Between tank degassing and circulation degassing uh, the thermodynamics and kinetics are not different. What is different? The rate constants are different, the equations are not different because the mass transfer coefficient in circulation degassing are not same as tank degassing process. The interfacial area that is going to be exp, you know uh, relevant in circulation degassing is not same and perhaps the inter interfacial area is significantly larger in circulation degassing than in tank degassing itself. So, the equations remains the same the kinetic parameters are only different in the two and therefore, the rates of degassing are very very different. In the tank degassing process basically the ladle will be put to a bigger tank. So, I will have a bigger ladle this is a big ladle and in that this ladle okay, my small ladle containing the molten steel is going to be put and this ladle is going to be covered and then the vacuum is going to be created. And this is containing molten metal the argon purging is going to be continuing and as a result of which there is going to be huge amount of stirring and then you have a pressure of 
So, that is the name of the process tank degassing process. So, we have ladle here, this is argon, studying is continued, and the total pressure is 10 to the power minus 3. We will continue with this.